All right, good evening. Welcome to Koala Baptist Church. Let's all stand together and sing, O come all ye faithful, together. O come all ye faithful, hymn 105 on the first. O come all ye faithful, O joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. Him, Christ the Lord. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exaltation. Oh, sing, all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God, oh, glory in the heart. adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord yea Lord we greet thee born this happy morning Jesus to thee be all glory flesh appearing oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him christ the lord over to him 109 it came upon the midnight clear him 109 in your hymnals it came upon the midnight clear on the first It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their hearts of gold, he on the earth could wear from heaven's all gracious King, the world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. Still through the cloven skies they come with peaceful wings unfurled. And still their heavenly music floats o'er all the weary world. Above its sad and lonely plains, they bend on hovering wing. And ever o'er its back, sounds of the blessed angel sings for lo the days are hastening on by prophet bards foretold when with the ever circling years comes round the age of gold and peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling and the whole world give back the 
song which now the angels sing. Wonderful singing. You may be seated. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and good to be here in the middle of the week. And I should say, Merry Christmas. It's uh, coming on very, very rapidly, and the days are getting darker and darker until here just a few days ahead, and we'll start seeing it get in longer and longer days and less and less darkness. But right now, we'll keep on with that and looking forward to Christmas. Well, at this time, we have our missionary emphasis, and I have uh, four missionaries and five slides I'm going to show you. Oh, I'm not going to show you the slides. I don't know what happened here. Uh, Oh, they're working now. Okay, good. Oh, it's just this one's not working. That's why. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, uh, we'll show you these slides. And then I'll, before I talk about these missionaries, however, I want to talk about our missionary. Uh, Dan and I was able to get up early in the morning and meet them at the airport on Tuesday morning and see them off. And so that was good to see them off about a quarter to six and and they were heading out, and so the day before, they did receive their visas. So they are good to travel, ready to go, ready to go to uh, language school. And their first visa is a student visa because they'll be going to language school in Bandung. So we just rejoice in that. And then I have several missionaries. The first one is Brother Smith, Buddy Smith, and, and Susan Smith. They've been in missionaries and been in Australia many years, and and the, the big thing about their letter, basically, and I'll just kind of let it go at this. There's some other things going on there. But, uh, boy, Australia is one of the tougher countries with the COVID and restrictions. So pray for them and pray for a lot of our missionaries that things can open up. Uh, you know, we have a fairly strict state when it comes to COVID. But some countries, it is still almost total lockdown. So pray for those in Australia. Dave and Carol Ross are missionaries to Indonesia. Uh, they're rejoicing with us over the Midkiffs, and the Midkiffs, if everything continues to continue, they'll go to central Java, and uh, they're looking at the new year, and it's just uh, hoping that Agape Baptist Church in Georgia and Iman Baptist in Puerto will become fully indigenous, that is self-supporting and uh, self-governing and uh, self-propagating, so they're praying for that. Mount Carmel is indigenous, and they're praying that sometime this year, they'll uh, soon, they'll be voting on Pak Philippus, who's somebody we know very well and worked with, a national pastor. They'll be voting on him to be a pastor, and of course, that's his home church and his home village, and I, I've been there, and so I'm uh, hoping that will work out. Uh, uh, Gregia Baptist in Salatiga is doing well, he talks about. They're getting ready for the Natalans, uh, Natalans, which is uh, Hari Natal is Christmas, and Natalans are Christmas celebrations, and they're getting ready for all those Christmas programs. It's a great opportunity in Indonesia with Christmas programs. Even the Islamic people will come to a Christmas program, and a lot of them come to know the Lord through Christmas program, and it is just a great opportunity there are a little bit of limits uh, he talks about uh, with this. They're during the, I guess, from the 23rd until January the 2nd, uh, everyone ha must stay in their own city. And how does that impact him? Well, he's a missionary, and going to these different churches will be limited. Uh, and then also the services will be at 50% uh, per government uh, rule. So uh, pray about that uh, situation, but thank the Lord uh, they're finding a way to continue the work. Well, uh, Okinawa uh, with our missionary, the gardeners, and I have a couple of slides for them. Uh, they're doing great. They've had a children's activity with the Grand Prix race. They make these little cars, and it's with the Awana Bible Clubs, and it's a good outreach opportunity. They've done well with that. They talk about how that COVID's uh, created some situations there. Of course, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of tracks were printed for the Olympic Games in Tokyo, and those were uh, not uh, able to be used because of travel limitations. And so they're just using them there on Okinawa. A lot of the uh, churches had big plans to travel, 
and uh, they weren't able to do that. So they're get, making good use of those gospel tracts, uh, handing them out. And uh, they were able, uh, in the first slide, you might see some drywall work done. They're able to go to a Bible college, do some work. And then I guess in the next slide uh, there with the gardeners, uh, you'll see there one of the great things, and this is always a missionary's goal, they've celebrated in this church planning endeavor uh, 20 years, but the goal is always to have a national pastor installed. You know, if you read the New Testament, you'll see those missionaries going to different places, and then they'll make sure there's uh, good leadership in those churches. As a matter of fact, there's a statement in the New Testament, Paul ordained elders in every city. Elders is another word for a pastor. And so what a blessing that uh, they were able to install uh, Yoshida Satoshi as the pastor there at the church. And that's what some of those pictures are there as uh, he's being installed in the church there. So what a blessing uh, that is with the gardeners and what a great opportunity to have a part in their work there in Okinawa. And then um, uh, Germany, um, again, the story is just some uh, limitations because of COVID. Uh, and, you know, they're praying for help uh, and uh, strength. The, uh, the Hornungs are missionaries in Germany. Uh, he mentions the fact that they're in their 80s. And... Uh, that has some, you know, concerns with health and things. So pray for them. Also, to attend other services, here's the rules. You have to be vaccinated twice or uh, you must have recovered from COVID. And I thought that was a kind of a neat thing that they at least see that as a uh, equal. They're, they're uh, at least acknowledging uh, natural immunity, which is something that many times is not being acknowledged. So. I'm happy that they're acknowledging uh, natural uh, immunity there. So that's good. Uh, and then what's the other thing? Oh, you have to have a test or have a negative test, not older than 24 hours. And so pray for them. That's regular. But for Christmas, it's different. For Christmas, uh, for any big event there, uh, they're really listening and keeping their ear to the ground and it's looking like uh that for christmas it's going to be total lockdown uh and so that really does uh impact ministry uh it's it's kind of difficult to understand but a lot of these ministries around the world they make a lot of hay uh during the christmas time they're able to gather prospects and see people come to know the lord and they're able to capitalize on that. And then they'll have several months of follow-up and, and fruit from seeds that are planted during the Christmas season. And uh, so uh, that's the story around the world. But uh, God's greater than all these things. And the Lord is still saving people. Uh, the Lord is still delivering people around the world. Churches are still being started. Churches are still installing national leadership. And uh, we're thankful for that. And you'll see several other missionary slides uh, while we uh, thank the Lord for our offering during the offertory. And if you'd like to place your offering back there at the back, you can after the service. And uh, don't forget your faith promise as well. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for all these missionary families. And it's good to hear from all of them. And it's just a privilege to have a part in their work. And we ask your blessings on them. And uh, bless these other missionaries we'll be seeing as well. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, all right, away in a manger. Hymn 121, we'll sing just the first and the last. Away in a manger, on the first and the last. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever, and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care, and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Let's all stand together for our final hymn, Joy to the World, hymn 104. We'll sing again, just the first and the last, 104. Joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Wonderful singing. You may be seated. Japanese is the third most difficult language to learn in the world. Today, we are going to sing two songs. First, our class song, We Are One in the Lord, Led by the Holy Spirit and the second, Silent Night. We hope you enjoy the music. Fortunately, I know Japanese. I'll interpret. Silent night, holy night. No, not really. Okay. Hey, that was really good. Thank you so much. That was a blessing. And uh, appreciate uh, Mrs. Heaton teaching the young folks Japanese and, and hope they uh, learn that. That can come in handy here on our island, can it not? And uh, it'll be a useful tool uh, anywhere. So thank the Lord for that. Well, uh, we want to uh, continue our series on the subject of booby traps, Satan's booby traps. And we've got to be careful because he has some traps out there. But the Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. We know that he has some things out there that can be traps. And we started talking about the booby trap, the landmine of money. 
Now, we got to have money, that's for sure. Uh, you can't go uh, to the store and, uh, you know, try to tell them how smart you are and let them accept that as payment. They're not going to do it. And you can't, uh, you know, if you're Brother Pobuck, you can't go to the restaurant and say, I'm good looking. I want to pay for my meal with my good looks. Uh, you know, it's just not going to work. Doesn't matter how good looking you are, it's not, they're not going to want it. They're not going to take it. They're going to want you to pay. Well, we got to have money, but we got to be careful how we think about money. That's the key. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus said unto them, Take heed, beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Now, there's the problem in our American culture. We think that often we think, even though we talk like we don't act, we don't think this, and we try to uh, proclaim that money is not significant, that's just a false pretense of, of acting like we're on the right track, when all the while in our heart we really believe and we really practice that our value is somehow or another tied in the amount of money that we have. And we talked about one of the booby traps of money is that money can divide. It can divide a lot of things. It can divide a church, can divide a marriage. One of the number one causes of divorce, money. And so we talked about that. Now tonight we're going to talk about how money can be a diversion. How money can be a diversion. You look at all the warnings and all the statements in this passage and it's very, very powerful. It's filled with a powerful word, one right after another. First is take heed. That is, look out, be aware, be alert, and be on the watch because there is a booby trap when it comes to money. And he said, look, uh, look out for covetousness. Now, let's face it. Most of us don't use the word covet this week. Matter of fact, uh, I'm sure a lot of us haven't used the word covetousness in our everyday talk. Uh, we just don't talk about it that much. And really, that's kind of strange because it is one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not uh, covet. And it's also strange that we don't talk about it because that has almost become the American way to covet. Greed drives us. Now, it is the fuel of capitalism. Now, I'm not saying capitalism's bad. I really believe in, in that system for a person to earn his living by the sweat of his face. I really am a believer in the opportunity to get out there and to make a living and to grow a business and to be able to hire more folks. And, and there's a lot of good that a lot of Christian folks have done with that. But we do not acquire wealth to add to our own sense of self-worth or acquire wealth to, to think that we're going to find joy or happiness in that. Uh, that's not true. It never is true, it's never been true, and it never will be true that money and joy are the same thing. And so we've got to be careful about our effort to make money, which we have to do. We need to make a living, but we've got to be careful about that pursuit of prospering a business and growing a business, whatever it may be, to maybe move up the corporate ladder, to maybe get some more training so you can get another job. All of that's neat and wonderful. But we've got to be careful that we don't allow the spirit of covetousness and greed and money to divert us from things that are more important. Let me give you a few examples this evening. Number one, money can divert our heart away from God to stuff. We're not thinking about the Lord. We're thinking about stuff. And the Bible says a lot about materialism. In the Old Testament, one of the Ten Commandments, as I said earlier, is thou shalt not covet. Now, that's amazing when you think about it, that the Bible put covetousness, the sin of covetousness, in the same class as adultery, idolatry, and stealing, and murder. Can you think about it? That's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. And Paul wrote about covetousness, and he said it should not be once named among the followers of Christ. As a matter of fact, in Colossians 3, 5, he said covetousness, which is idolatry. So to think about that, sometimes we, we uh, think of covetousness and the sinfulness of it 
And we sort of give it a pass as sort of a polite sin. Well, it's okay because they just got a little carried away. But the Bible says that when we get that spirit of covetousness, that desire, that passion for stuff, then it is just the same as bowing down to an idol and worshiping an idol. And I don't think very many Americans would have a, a god carved out of stone or wood and would bow down to that thing. And yet we do bow down to the dollar and the stuff that the dollar can buy. Jesus here said that it's not what brings value to life. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. You don't even factor that in when you're trying to think about the value of your life. Uh, we looked at uh, and we pray about missionaries in some of the countries in our third world nations. You'll find that the folks that have any money, there's really no middle class. There's only a small percentage of rich. And then everybody else in the country is very, very poor. And yet I've been to uh, Indonesia where they may make $60 a month, and I've seen them give. And uh, man, uh, they some of the churches, a lot of the churches there, they don't just have a general fund and faith promise. I mean, they've got like five different funds. They will uh, pass two different, they don't really have offering plates. They have a little, um, uh, I guess kind of a velvet pouch-like thing with a handle on it they pass. And then they'll have a couple of boxes for special offerings. And uh, the people are so generous to give. I've been in Thailand. And, uh, well, they don't have any money. And yet, when their uh, rice harvest comes, they'll come and bring a portion of their rice uh, to give uh, to the Lord. Well, that's, that's a, a blessing. And you can look at those people. And those people have very rich and valuable lives. I've been to Indonesia and fellowship with Christians and very, very poor. And yet they have such great joy. They're happy folks. They know the Lord. They have fellowship at church. They read their Bible and they can laugh like nobody's business. And uh, it doesn't take much to get them to laugh. They're having a good time in the Lord. And so that's not our life stuff. Uh, society says uh, that we need more. They're always telling us we need more. That's what, how advertising makes a business. More of what? Well, more of things. And it's, it's hard for us to equate the, uh, uh, the things that we possess to things. We, we really don't think about uh, these things that we possess as just material objects. We think of them as our precious belongings. And we forget that it's just stuff. And boy, we blessed in this country. The average American home has 25 a hundred square feet uh, compared to 1,400 square feet uh, in 1970. One in every 10 Americans will rent a special space away from their home. And what do you think they put in that special space away from their home? Somebody tell me. Stuff. Stuff. Exactly right. Junk. <laughs> uh, junk. Oh, man. What a trap. We've moved. I don't know how many times my wife and I in ministry have been called upon to help people uh, empty out a storage unit. And this is what we discovered when we went to do it. It was junk. And many times, every bit of it, good money was paid out to rent the space. Every bit of it went to the dump ground. Can you imagine that? To rent a space just to store stuff. <laughs> It's, uh, it's amazing. Now, if some of you got a rental unit, excuse me, I'm not, uh, you may have some very highly valued things in there, and I'm not talking about you, okay? That was close. Uh, because I know you may have some very precious items in there, and it's amazing. Matter of fact, I've been to storage units. I had a, we were uh, in church work, and there was one time we had to have some uh, storage units, and I was fascinated to discover that there were some homeless people that they rented that storage unit. So they couldn't be there at night, but they'd go in there in the, in the day in the storage unit and put a, a sleeping bag down and sleep in there. That's, that's what people do sometimes in Hawaii. 
because they could at least sleep in a safe, comfortable place and then, you know, walk around all night long and then sleep during the day. But nevertheless, uh, one in ten Americans have a storage space. There are 95,000 garage sales listed on Craigslist across the country, 95,000 every week. And there's 165,000 garage sales uh, in the country every week. And what do you think they're going to be selling at garage sales? Somebody tell me. Stuff, okay? Stuff, just things they're going to be selling. And things that, uh, do you think they're going to be selling broken down stuff? Or stuff that might work? They're, gonna, they're not going to be selling uh, an old pair of, uh, well, I started to say they're not going to be selling a pair of, of old holy jeans, but that might be fashionable for some folks. I don't know. Uh, they're not going to be selling uh, a coffee pot that doesn't work. They're going to be selling a coffee pot that does work, but uh, they've got another coffee pot that's better that works at their home, so they've got to get rid of the other one that does work. That's what they're going to be selling. And so what a blessing it is to think about that the Christians shouldn't be fascinated with stuff. A man explained why I bought a new car. And he said this, I was faced with the choice of buying a $87 battery for my old car or buying a $20,000 new car. And they wanted cash for the battery. But for the car, I could finance it. And so that's what happened. He went and financed the car. Most people are financing their lifestyle through debt. And it's kind of like the old McDonald's farm instead of, uh, you know, here a cow, there a cow, everywhere. It's a, here a debt, there a debt, everywhere a debt, debt. You know, there's kind of that, that ought to be their song because it's just debt, 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 debt. All because of too much stuff. And sometimes we allow all the stuff to rob us of valuable time. In this country, we've got so many unnecessary jobs on Sundays, the Lord's Day. I'm not talking about hospital or a fireman or a policeman. I'm talking about unnecessary things because we're trying to pay for more stuff. Right now, there are people that are furiously working, even putting in extra time, and the thing that's on their mind every day is the big vacation they're going to be taking. And very little time to contemplate the service they'll render to the Lord. Most people will sacrifice for some form of recreation or hobby, but nothing for the Lord because of the acquisition of stuff. And we need to uh, get away from that. Money can divert our attention away from what's really valuable. Money can divert our Attention from love to stuff. We're supposed to be concerned about people, but sometimes the effort to get money can take our mind away from people. And uh, we uh, admit that you can have some things that will help take care of your family, will help feed the hungry, clothe the poor. Uh, we have some things that can help us to uh, enjoy life, and we can have some Things that we can help missionaries to acquire to help them do a better work. But sometimes the pursuit of things, covetousness, leads us to begin to forsake our loved ones. And a businessman will think as long as his child has a brand new Mac computer to work on, it'll be okay if he very seldom sees the child. He knows full well that he could maybe take a job that would help him be a greater presence and could sustain his family. But he tells himself it's better to constantly be away in order that his family may have more stuff. We ignore others because we want more stuff. We are supposed to love people and use things. But with the, the diversion that money can cause, we can get to the place where we Use people and love things. And that's wrong. We need to love people and use things. We can get the focus wrong. Herbert and Hazel were riding down the road and they had the wrong focus. Hazel said, you know, Herbert, if it were not for my money, we wouldn't have this car. And Herbert said, that's right, Hazel. You're right. And Hazel said, you know, Herbert, 
If it were not for the money I inherited, we wouldn't have our house. And he says, yes, Hazel, you're absolutely right. And Hazel said, you know, Herbert, if it were not for my money, we wouldn't be able to buy all this jewelry that I have. And he said, well, that's certainly right, Hazel. And uh, you hit the nail on the head. And Hazel said, you know, Herbert, if it weren't for my money, we wouldn't have our big wide screen television and, and to have that 80 inch television in our home. He said, oh, Hazel, that's right. And I enjoy that watching football games. And Hazel said, Herbert, the car wouldn't be here. The house wouldn't be here. The jewelry wouldn't be here. The big TV wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for my money. And finally Herbert said. Yes Hazel you're right. And if it weren't for your money. I wouldn't be here. But. Uh, uh, <laughs> but anyway. Sometimes people have the wrong focus. And we need to focus on. People not stuff. And be careful. We need to be careful about that. Money can divert us away from. Contentment to stress. The Lord wants us and has promised us. To be content with. With great, great, with uh, contentment, the Bible tells us, is great gain. And so we need to be content. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 6, a verse that we looked at, I think it was last week, but we'll look at it again over in 1 Timothy 6. We read what the, Lord, what the Bible says about money and covetousness, a verse that we ought to think about uh, quite a bit. The Bible says there, in having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation. And notice it says a snare. You know what a snare is? It's a booby trap. It's a landmine. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Oh, listen, money and things and the pursuit of them can bring awful stress. Somebody said Americans can be divided into three categories. The haves, the have-nots, and the have-not-paids for what they have. Okay, and that's, a, that's true. Uh, people get stressed about stuff. It's sometimes good maybe not to have quite as good a stuff. You don't stress about it. One time I had an old beat up when I first moved to the island I bought an old beat up Toyota pickup I did not know that that was a valuable item even though it was beat up and I had it stolen over in Wahiawa but nevertheless uh, that truck was the best vehicle I ever owned I never had to work on it I could wash it and it looked just the same so guess what I never stressed about washing it you know and uh, you know it had a little holes in the roof and I'd put some silicone in there to kind of keep it from raining on me while I was inside the car and uh, didn't have an air conditioner, but had one of those little triangle windows. I could open it up and catch air and blow air on me. And I love that little, little truck, but uh, I guess I might've loved it too much because the Lord took it away. But I can tell you this much. It didn't cause me any stress because I didn't spend hardly any time in it. Matter of fact, a fellow rear ended me over there in the, on Waimana home road in the Crow city and bent the bumper a little bit and he said I'm sorry his insurance called me and sent me a check for $800 and and I took it to the inspection I said will this pass like this they said yes I said okay and I took the $800 to the bank <laughs> never fixed the truck well uh, we can but other things you can stress you can stress about it I, I got a I right now I drive a minivan and uh, well, guess what? I don't feel too cool driving a minivan. There's no possibility of me feeling like, you know, I'm really something else driving this minivan, okay? I uh, just don't feel that way. Well, my wife went and made a visit over on the Marine base, and some little kid came along on his bicycle or a key or something, and right down the whole side of it, just, uh, just, just scratched all the way down the side. And when it happened, I wasn't stressed out one little bit. It's just a car. It's just a minivan. Good thing it wasn't Lamborghini or I would have been uh, with the 15 coats of paint. I would have been like really stressed maybe. Uh, but the idea is, is this money or covetousness can cause us to be stressed and we worry about things. But if something gets broken, then 
then it's no big, big deal. It's just a thing. One time I was getting ready for work, and this was in Texas. And I was right there to pull a shirt out of the closet, and the whole, I heard this boom, and the whole house shook. And, and I couldn't believe what happened. And then I went out to the carport, and somebody very near and close to me, we had bought a brand new uh, Ford Taurus. It was taking the kids to school, and the back door was open, and it uh, caught on the post of the door po of the uh, carport and bent the door back. The door was supposed to go this way, but it went this way, okay? And that's what caused, guess what? Just a thing? And uh, the fellow who's a member of a church at the, the body shop said, you didn't get mad to that person that was uh, very close to you, uh, did you? And I said, no, I didn't. I, I was just glad everybody was safe. And it's just a thing, just a thing. But I have seen people scratch a thing or break a thing, and you would think that somebody had committed murder uh, because of that. You would think that it was the end of the world. Money can cause stress. Listen, uh, I've had my children be in car accidents. And you think I was one little bit worried about the vehicle? No. I said, you're safe, and that's all I care about. You're safe. And I have an idea, this is a better lesson on driving than you'll ever have the rest of your life. Well, what a blessing it is. What a blessing to, to not be stressed by money. God's going to take care of us, and we need to think. Think about this kind of stress. I've noticed this about money. Sometimes the more you get, the more you want. That causes stress. And that can take contentment away. Number two. The more other people have, I've noticed that kind of stresses me out because sometimes that makes me want, want to have more, okay? Uh, the more you have, to, you have, the more you have to worry over and man, maintain. You've got to think about it, pay for it, insure it, clean it, repair it, rearrange it, fret over it, move it around. And I've had stuff that, that I've never used but I've moved that thing around, moved it here, moved it there, and uh, dusted it off and moved it around, and, and well, uh, maybe a little bit too much stress over that thing. I remember one time uh, when I was raising my children that they had these swing sets. Anybody remember swing sets? And they had them at Kmart and Walmart, and they'd always put them up in the air, like straddling the aisle. They'd put them up on the top shelf, and... There it was with a slide and a bar you could swing and a little seesaw that goes back and forth and swing. Well, uh, and they weren't very expensive. They were like $119 or something like that. But I remember we got our kids one of those for one of their birthdays. You want to talk about stress? Putting one of those swing sets together. There's the space shuttle and the number of parts the space shuttle has. And then there's... The swing set right there. I mean, I thought I was never going to get that thing together. And, and of course, uh, you know, this is what I did. I opened up the package. There were the instructions. Put those over there. I know how to do this. And then I had to go try to find the instructions and then, you know, uh, rebuild it right. But anyway, the, the stress of stuff can be uh, kind of amazing. The more you have sometimes, the more you have to lose. The more... Uh, you hurt yourself sometimes trying to hold on to those things. The more you have, the more you'll leave behind for somebody else to enjoy. It's not what's most important. Money can divert us away also from joy. You would think there'd be more happy people in America with all that we have. Somebody said that the motto of America is life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. But it's not the purchase of happiness, it's the pursuit. The love of money is the root of all evils. I notice there's just something that's fascinating. People will say, oh, I love the smell 
of a new car. And I'm thinking, what? It's kind of chemically, what's the smell about a new car? It smells like materials, you know? But they'll go, ah, I love the smell of a new car. And I thought, well, we ought to make a perfume out of it, you know? And everybody can uh, uh, wear a fragrance of a new car. I thought that, and then I was at the store, and I was over there in the auto section, and wouldn't you believe I found an air freshener that said new car smell. Isn't that fascinating? So the good news is you may have a jalopy, but you can go squirt some of that stuff in there, and it'll smell new. What a blessing. But it's ridiculous the things that we get a hold of. And we think it'll bring joy, but it doesn't. Money will divert us away from to where we'll trade eternal things for things that don't last. He said this, the Lord, in Matthew 6, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Well, uh, there may be some things that you have and you stow it away, and before you know it, one of the things I experienced when I came to Hawaii was I'm from a dry place and I came here. I noticed it rained a lot and I had things stored in the back of the closet. Big mistake to keep things back there that you forget about because the thing was just covered in mold, you know, and ruined. Well, that's because that's the nature of stuff. It wears out, it gives out, and... When we look at an automobile, we think it'll last forever. But an automobile is a consumable item. It will wear out. I remember when I was a young person, if we wanted to listen to music, we had a flat black disc uh, record. That's how we'd listen to music. And then for a while there, we had this little box about like this. We called it an 8-track. Anybody remember those? Okay. And then we went from 8-track to cassette tapes. And then we went to CDs. And now, probably if a young person was to get music, they'd probably get a download, purchase it, and have it downloaded onto their computer. Not even have any kind of a physical situation. Well, things don't last. Technology doesn't last. I was all excited. I was in a thrift store. And I saw these, I knew a football jersey or a baseball I knew those things were very expensive. You know, a professional team might be a Red Sox baseball uh, shirt, you know. And, and you know, that'd be valuable, right, Brother Pobuck? I mean, extremely valuable. And I thought, man, here it is for $12 or $15. And I'd be all excited until my son said, Dad, you know those jerseys that are in there? It's because the name on the back is some guy that used to play for the team, and now he got traded to another team, and now then that thing's not worth anything anymore because he doesn't play for them anymore. I said, no. He said, yes. Check the names on there. So he, he informed me about the way it works. So that's why it's no good. Nobody wants that when the guy moved over to, you know, play for the Yankees. I mean, you wouldn't want to wear a Red Sox jersey and the guy moved over to play for the Yankees. No way. That's junk. Well, uh, that's the way it is. And... Uh, we begin to put value in things that just won't last. Here's what the scripture says. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. That's his strong city. That's his, that's his strength. And a high wall is his own conceit. In other words, the Bible's saying he's a dreamer. He's not really valuing what really is valuable. Corinthians warns about comparing ourselves. And we begin to attach value because somebody else has something. Well, money can divert our attention from things that satisfy to things that will never satisfy. Satisfy. The Romans had a proverb that said that money's like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you become. Lee Iacocca, who was fired by Ford Motor Company, uh, later revived Chrysler, remembered his Italian-born father who said, be careful about money. When you have 5,000, you'll want 10. And when you have 10, you'll want 20. And I, Coca, continued, he was right. No matter what you have, it's never enough. And Ray Stedman said that people suffer from destination sickness. They get to where they thought they wanted to be, and somehow or another, 
it's not at all what they thought it would be. It's because it doesn't bring satisfaction. And then finally this evening, money can divert us away from God's work. The book of Haggai, the remnant returns, but they're not rebuilding the house of the Lord. And so the word of the Lord came to Haggai there in Haggai chapter 1, verse 3. And the Lord said, It's time for you, O ye that dwell in sealed houses, and this house lie waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. The investment in many other things above God's work. Time for anything and everything, but not God's work. Money for anything and everything, but nothing to help. With God's work. What's the answer? Well, number one, rejoice in what God has given you. Be content with such things you have, Hebrews 13, 5. That can come with a renewed mind. Number two, be sure and return the tithe to the Lord. And number three, refocus on permanent values. Colossians 3 says, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. All the stuff that's going to rot away, all the stuff that's going to ruin and not last. You may have some, you may have some regrets about spending too much effort and time in that. But all the things that are important, time with your children, teaching them, time with your spouse, family time like Christmas time here or worshiping the Lord, handing out gospel tracts and being a friend, helping a friend, do some things. All those things that count for service uh, are going to be things that are going to last and be very, very valuable. Well, thank you for your attention. Let me just uh, remind you to pray for all the different folks that need prayer. I continue to pray for Brother Sato Yama as he recovers from his knee surgery. Pray for Jamie's dad. Good to see the Sykes here Sunday, so they're recovering from... Uh, their sickness, so praise the Lord with the, for that. Pray for Angel and Claire and the safe arrival of their baby. And, of course, we're so thankful for little Adam uh, making it here safely. And just continue to pray for him and mom and dad. And then continue to pray for Mrs. Ward, who made it home with her struggles. So continue to pray for Mrs. Ward. Uh, continue to pray for Brother Richardson. And, by the way, I want to say how much I appreciate everyone that helped us out with that funeral. I want to say thank you, first of all, to all of our teachers and Brother Valadaris uh, for going the extra mile of moving classes, rearranging things, and, and the students for eating lunch at different places. Everybody that really worked on that in the school, I appreciate that. Thank you to all the ladies that helped us with, with the food and the meal and, and just all the different things. I appreciate so much uh, the help for that funeral. And everything went well, and I think it was a good uplifting time and a good time for the gospel to be shared. And so I, I thank you so much for that. Pray for uh, Orrin and Brooke, who will be getting married here on Tuesday. And that's going to be exciting. But before that, we got some activity. Let's see. Friday, there is a bridal shower. I'm glad I got that right word out, okay? <laughs> and uh, a bridal shower. And that's going to be over at the Hernandez. What time is that, Miss? 4.30. And if you, please tell Deanna if you're planning on uh, going to that. That'll be a lot uh, of fun and, and that'll be a help. You need a few things when you get started. We talked about stuff, but it's nice to get a few things because you need them there when you get married. And Maybe Orrin will need a piece of toast or something, so a toaster, whatever they need, you, you let them know, okay? Uh, then let's see here. Uh, on Saturday, Orrin, what time? Four, four o'clock here. There's going to be a fellowship time for Orrin. And we're not saying bachelor party because we don't have really what people think of when it comes to bachelor party. This is a Christian thing, okay? And uh, just have a fellowship time uh, for him, and, and uh, we'll be mourning. No, 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 not really. We'll be celebrating his uh, uh, wedding, and if you'd like to help out with that, Brother Caesar and some fellows will be here, and they'll meet you right down here, right after service, right? If you'd like to...
If you'd like to come, come over here and he'll meet you right down here if you'd like to come to that Saturday at 4. And just to congratulate Orr and let you know you're behind him, you're supporting him, and that'll be a lot of fun. And uh, so you do that. And, by, and again, uh, we're happy for them. Look forward to that on Tuesday. And what time is the wedding? 4.30. All right. Four. All right. All right. Well, that would be good if you were late to your wedding. Might cause some stress, but uh, 4.30, that would be great. Four, four. <laughs> now you got now you got me mixed up. Okay, four o'clock. All right, four o'clock on Wednesday. Oh yeah, Tuesday. Not right. Yeah, four o'clock on Tuesday. So that'll be great. Uh, all right. Do pray for that that everything goes well. Hey, uh, don't forget to pray for our Vision Sunday, which is the second Sunday in January. Pray a lot about that. We'll have a fellowship, and I'll be doing some mailing, telling you about what it's all going to be about. And then pray for this Sunday. I'll be preaching a special Christmas message, so invite some folks to come uh, this Sunday. All right. Appreciate that. Any other special requests we need to add? Somebody? Uh, I know there's several on the list there. You can pick up the list. Anybody? Anything's come up here recently? Okay. Let's pray for these things. And again, thank you to everybody who helped out with the funeral. I forgot to mention uh, the honor guard. Thank you, fellas. That was really a blessing. I know it took a lot of work for you, and, and the funeral was spread out, so it took a, a while for them. I think they had to miss almost all day of work, and I and, uh, appreciate all the help. It was really, really a blessing, and all that participated in that. And I want to say especially, uh, and I don't want to embarrass them, but I want to say especially uh, how much I appreciate the Thorpes being uh, such a sweet blessing uh, to the Richardsons and, and being there uh, for them and and uh, having their trust to be able to sit there with them and and uh, just a really a sweet blessing and I appreciate uh, Mrs. Thorpe and her words and she read them so elegantly I didn't know she had that in her we'll maybe have to get her doing some uh, talks around here did a great job on on that so let's stand together let's pray together and look forward to a great uh, a Sunday. Appreciate you all, and I hope the, all the young folks have a Merry Christmas, and I hope you enjoy your holiday. If you need some extra schoolwork because you just feel like you're missing out, just come on up here, and we'll get you some extra schoolwork, okay? All right. Well, I'm going to ask Brother Brett to come pray for us, and then uh, if uh, Brother Oren, would you come pray as well? Come up here after you come up with Brett here. All right. Thank you, sir. We come before you this evening. I want to thank you for the opportunity it is to be in your house together here tonight. Thank you for the message that you provided for us from Pastor Woodfin. Father, I do want to uplift these requests to you. There are many families who are going through a very difficult time this Christmas season, uh, with the deaths in the family, and many are sick, many are recovering from sickness and or surgery. And there's just a lot of things going on, and uh, we need your intervention in our lives, and we ask for your continued blessings. I do also ask that these situations will ultimately draw us closer to you and draw each family closer to you and give us an opportunity to share your love for those who are around us. Pray for those families uh, during this Christmas time. And I know also many are affected from the water situation as well uh, here in Hawaii. I pray for those families as well that you'll you comfort them and help these situations to be resolved quickly and efficiently. And so we do thank you for your many blessings. We ask for your uh, safety tonight uh, as we return home. And we just thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Great. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. Um, we just thank you for uh, your many blessings, God, everything that you've done for us, even with um, the students to be able to get done with school this week. Um, you know, some of us still have to go. Uh, going to work or going to do anything else that we have to do, God. We just thank you so much for this this time, um, this Christmas season, that we can stop and reflect on um, just what you've done and, and just the reason that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. We just thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to meet here in church and to fellowship and um, to hear from your word, God. So just ask now that you just bless us now as we leave. 
Um, help us to get to our home safely. Um, enjoy the rest of our night, Lord. We love you, Lord. That you continue to bless us, Lord. You are my prayer. Amen.